Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining the call today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, prototyping methods and techniques uh, in today's webinar. Uh, the webinar is being uh, offered through the EOSC Digital Innovation Hub, which is currently uh, part of the EOS Future Project. Uh, the EOS Future Project receives uh, funding from the European Union, uh, and you can see the details of that in the, on your screen. Uh, but on the screen, you can also find our uh, social media handles and the website. Uh, I highly recommend that you follow us for future trainings and uh, similar activities. Uh, some, before I introduce myself, uh, some housekeeping rules. Uh, uh, the webinar is being recorded, as you uh, heard just now. Um, the more interaction, the better uh, it is. It's the more questions you ask, the better it is for me uh, and the better it is for everybody else in the session uh, because that's where everybody's doubts can be clarified and, um, and solved. Um, we prefer that you ask your questions using the Q&A functionalities. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a second screen today. So I, I will be trying to juggle through uh, raised hands. So we do prefer you ask your questions through the Q&A functionality in the Zoom. But if you cannot, uh, or uh, if you prefer more uh, more face-to-face uh, uh, -face interaction, then uh, you can always raise your hand and uh, either Gwen or Elisa, uh, who are supporting me in the webinar today, uh, will will find you and um, stop me and uh, we, we can have the conversation at that point. Um, purely from a selfish point of view, there will be a survey at the end of the webinar uh, to provide your feedback on whether you like the session, what did you find useful and whatnot, and uh, how was I performing the uh, webinar and so on. It's gonna be a very small uh, survey, so it, um, I'll really appreciate your feedback on that. Uh, other than that, well, we've been having virtual meetings for practically the last two couple of years. So I, I think everybody is well aware of uh, the etiquettes uh, involved in the um, involved in virtual meetings. So uh, I hope we all follow them quite well. Um, so about me, uh, I am Smitesh, uh, Smitesh and Jain, if you want the full name, uh, Smitesh. Um, so I was born, brought up in India. So I have a Indian accent, I've been told. Uh, so at any point of time, if you are unable to understand what I'm trying to say, or if I'm speaking too fast, uh, or whatever it is the case, uh, raise your hand or ping me uh, somehow. Uh, and I'll I'll try to uh, circle back and clarify uh, what I've been speaking in meanwhile. Um, in terms of academic background, I have studied innovation management and entrepreneurship here in Netherlands. Uh, I'm based out of uh, The Hague in the Netherlands, uh, and I work at EGI, uh, which is based in Amsterdam. Um, so for the past about five and a half, six years, I've been working in the field of innovation management. Um, before uh, 2021, I used to work in corporate innovation. And now since 2021, I've been working at EGI and in innovation management and exploitation in uh, European context. Um, and I have a lot of experience in uh, managing innovation, uh, management, uh, doing, running idea, idea collection campaigns, open innovation, brainstorming and brain writing sessions and training uh, employees in innovation methodologies. This is where uh, I come in uh, for this webinar, um, and I have also worked in the past in knowledge management and software development. Um, originally, I am from a mechanical engineering background, so my, uh, though, as you can see, that uh, I started uh, formal education and formal working in innovation management a bit recently, uh, I've always been involved uh, in the prototyping and uh, in uh, in build, measure, learn kind of in uh, uh, lean cycles uh, in the uh, in the past as well. So in reality, my journey uh, with uh, with prototyping started long time ago in in the late 20, uh, 2010s. Um, and I was actually a student in India uh, studying mechanical engineering. And in the second year, we wanted to uh, participate in this competition. Uh, it's like Society of Automotive Engineers, and every year they would organize a competition in the US uh, to where teams could come in uh, from universities could come in and showcase their designs for unmanned aerial vehicles. So we had this ambition of uh, participating in the competition, uh, and we thought, oh, we will be uh, will be uh, will be different from everybody, and we'll try to build a plane which uh, nobody had built before, or at least 
a design which has never been built in the competition before. Uh, you see the early, very early, the first prototype of that design that we had come up with. Um, I'm sure uh, most of you know. So this this airplane was supposed to be a propeller, uh, sort of a uh, propeller powered airplane. So if you have seen uh, propeller powered airplanes in the past, uh, you would have seen that most of them have the propellers in the front. Uh, that's because of a uh, lot of reasons. But we were like, okay, we want to be, uh, we want to be different. We want to stand out, so we will put the uh, put the engine at the back, right? So that's where we started with the original design, and that's what you see in the uh, in the, the this. It's about one is to ten uh, in terms of uh, scale. So the original plane was about three meters uh, wide and about two meters in length. So this is this is like really 30 centimeters across uh, by about uh, I think it was around 15 centimeters at that point uh, in length, um, and we we built it uh, with whatever material we could find at, in our in our lab at that point. As you can see, there's just uh, like a piece of foam there. Uh, the aim was not to for us to see actually uh, whether this plane could fly or not. The aim was to see if our design in the first place could be built um, and. You can see that what we did was uh, we put the uh, the tail of the plane on top of the horizontal uh, vertical tails. So the horizontal tail at, at the back you can see is on top of the two vertical tails. And we thought it oh, well, it was a good design, and we tried to build it. And even when we were trying to do this, we we realized that this this will never work because the amount of uh, effort required to uh, to mount that uh, horizontal tail on the top of the vertical tail was too much. And when we would have scaled this size to, to the original size, the, the, the mechanic, me mechanics would not really work. Um, so, so when we try to come up with uh, alternators, uh, of course, I'm not going to show you all the images and all the iterations today, um, but I can show you the next part of it um, is, it's not just that we build physical prototypes, we build digital as well. Um, as a background in mechanical engineering, so we, we were used to working with uh, computer-aided design softwares. So we all actually designed each and every element of the plane in, uh, in, a, in a digital environment before we actually went on to build it. Um, of course, there was a lot of other work involved, and this was the almost the final design. Uh, um, and this was the final plane that we built. Uh, the images are a bit uh, low quality. Uh, because they were taken uh, about 12 years ago with, with cell phones, which were not the best at that point. And I didn't know that I was going to use these images one day to explain prototyping to people. Uh, so uh, I apologize for those images. Uh, but yeah, you get the principle behind the prototyping, at least I, I hope uh, that the, the concept is to, to validate what you are trying to do and what you're trying to build before you actually even build it. As you can see, if you compare the two images, you can see so much difference between the two two designs. You can see that there is that the body is longer, uh, the tail is uh, tail is on the on the bottom. Uh, there are wing tips at the side, um, and, and so on. So there is there was a lot of a uh, lot of changes which happened from there to this. Uh, and if we had tried to build a full scale model at this point. Uh, with for this design, it would have been a lot of waste of time, uh, a lot of waste of resources. Um, and a lot of waste of money as well, uh, which as a student team, we didn't have a lot of uh, to, to play around with. So, so prototyping and making these uh, early iterations was really, really important for us. Uh, so before we go into the different methods of, of what a prototype is uh, and what they are and how to build one and so on, um, let's, let's talk about what is a prototype, right? Um, it, it comes from the word um, of uh, from Greek word called prototypos, uh, which means like the first example, right? So it's it's an early sample model or release of a product. You know, it can be a service even uh, created to test a concept or a process, right? So on the left you see like a cardboard cutout of a, of a phone or a, of, a, of a laptop. So that's what a prototype is. And in reality, everything is a prototype. I'll give you some examples to showcase that we knowingly or unknowingly how we build prototypes uh, for almost everything in our lives. So last year, me and my uh, girlfriend, we bought a new apartment. So we wanted to 
uh, understand how we are going to um, place the furniture in the in the in the living room that we have. Uh, and of course, we couldn't buy the furniture to uh, place it and see uh, how we're gonna how we're gonna do it. And well, we didn't want to hire an interior designer because we, we wanted it to be a bit more personal and we wanted it to have our own touch. So what what we did was well, actually, my girlfriend has uh, is she's better at coming up with ideas, and I'm I'm the person better at implementation. So on the on the screen, you see like three images, which I quickly uh, cooked up in PowerPoint, actually. It's it's a you know it's a scaled down model of our living room. The, you can see the orange is the border of the living room, and there are different furniture pieces uh, which are which are there. So there's a L sofa, there's a U sofa. Uh, sometimes it's facing the front, sometimes it's facing the back, and and so on. So what we did was we did these images, we created these images, and we sent it out to our friends and our our family, asking like, what do you, which one do you like? You know, uh, what do you think about them? Um, and we, then we got feedback on that, on what, why some people like what, uh, which designs and why uh, they like the other designs. And that really helped us with uh, understanding on what kind of uh, layout we wanted for our place and uh, what kind of things we wanted to uh, do. So that's, that's sort of the aim of, uh, that's sort of the goal behind prototyping, right? So uh, the broad definition that I talked about uh, in the previous slide, and while saying that everything is a prototype, um, it really is, you know, you can prototype almost any kind of idea in your life. So you can sketch a floor plan like we did, uh, or you can uh, write up, you know, oftentimes you can write out a recipe to test um, and then you make it and you uh, see what went wrong and then you update it. And that's also a prototyping process, right? Um, so, well, if I show you the final image, this is the final image of our, uh, of our, uh, living room you can see that we somewhat went with the with with the one in the uh, one in the middle though without the uh, uh, four chairs in the back is when we realized that we did put the sofa that okay maybe putting four more chairs at the back might be a bit too much in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, having stuff there so so we decided to skip that part but but it really helped us understand what kind of sofa we wanted, what kind of size of the sofa we wanted, what elements we wanted to buy from the from the furniture store, and what what to look at, and things like that. So that that's actually a very good way of moving into the next segment of our talk, which is why do we prototype, right? So I mean, prototyping takes time. Uh, even if you use simple methods, it's still some time which you are using to build something which is not really your end product. So why should you to try to do a prototype? Why should you try to build something um, before um, before you build the actual product, right? Uh, it takes, so there are four more, four key reasons. There are actually, you can dwell into deeper into each of these reasons. I won't go into it because this is not a lecture. It's more of a webinar on how to do prototyping, but I'll just, briefly mention why, what these four topics are, right? So for the four reasons why you wanna do prototyping is to understand, uh, to communicate, to test, and to advocate, right? So there are many good reasons, but these are the four most important ones. And what do what are they? So what is what do we mean by understand? So prototypes are useful for to understand what uh, your users, the problem that you're trying to solve, and the solution that you're pursuing is the correct one for the user. So it's not just about trying to understand the final point, right? Oftentimes it's seen uh, like the, the that the prototype is a way for you to check if, if the thing you are going to build is something the users want. It's not just that. It's not just about understanding that aspect of, uh, of your design process. It's also understanding the user. It's also understanding the problem that you're trying to solve. A couple of uh, techniques that I would mention in the later stages, uh, for example, like story storyboarding. So in storyboarding, you often create a, a, a entire user journey. Uh, you draw it out and you understand what the user does and how, why he does what he does. So those kind of prototypes actually help you understand the user, the, their behavior, their, their way of working and why do they do things the way they do. And that is a key aspect of a design process for any, any company, right? Um, and oftentimes prototyping things uh, can help you understand the problem you're trying to solve, right? 
uh, there is an example I had uh, read recently about uh, Sega, which uh, creates those stand-up um, uh, stand cycles, uh, is that they, uh, they identified that there was a gap in the market between, uh, between something uh, like walking and something like cycling or, uh, uh, or taking a car. Right? So there was some sort of a gap in between uh, there, for, which could be exploited. And that's how they ended up com uh, coming up with the idea of, uh, of, of the stand-up uh, stand uh, stand uh, cycle is what it's called, I think. Um, and that's actually, they didn't do too much work on that because it's when they released the product is when they realized, okay, there are a lot of other problems uh, associated with stand-up because uh, a lot of countries have uh, rains, uh, there are adverse, uh, adverse conditions. Uh, which can affect somebody driving a, a standard scooter. Um, there are a lot of countries do not have appropriate infrastructures for those uh, kind of vehicles. So, so oftentimes do, building these prototypes in early stages uh, and using them and trying to get feedback from them can better understand, uh, can help you better understand the problem you're trying to solve. And then, then you can use that aspect to actually improve your product in the, uh, in the, in the going forward. Uh, next aspect is uh, to be able to communicate. So prototypes are useful to communicate your ideas to your users, to your team, and to your stakeholders, right? So oftentimes uh, when you do brainstorming or when you come up with ideas, you have all these ideas in your head, right? Or maybe they are on a bunch of post-its and everything, but it's still not tangible enough. It's still intangible. It's a lot of the vision of the uh, vision of your idea is in your head. Right. Um, maybe it's in a uh, vision of multiple uh, head of multiple people, but it's still in your head. So it's it's actually good to build a prototype. What you do is put whatever is inside your head and transfer it into a physical or a digital medium. So you transform something which is fuzzy uh, and generalized thought into a, something concrete, uh, something which people can see and understand what you mean. Right. So if you if you don't have a prototype, uh, each person you talk to. Uh, will have a unique mental visualization of your idea. So if you tell somebody, this is, hey, this is my idea, if you go from person to person, their, their view of that idea will change. So instead, when you show a prototype, it, it, it actually solidifies what you're trying to do. And it actually solidifies for, for yourself and for your team as well. Uh, is because when you start drawing it out or start building it is when, you, when I, those ideas you already start finding faults in those ideas and you can already start correcting some of those aspects of it. Um, so instead of talking in vague general terms, you can point directly to the object uh, or, or a screen that may be the prototype that you have created. And more or less, you will have everybody on the same page when you, when you talk to them about what is your idea, right? Uh, the next aspect, which is, of which is the most important uh, is to test and improve. Uh, we all probably have heard of the build, measure, learn, lean startup cycle, um, but it can often be hard to make that first prototype. You know, you 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 might think, oh, maybe this is not the best idea. Maybe this is not uh, the best idea to put your time and money and uh, resources towards, right? Uh, but instead of you know trying to spin those wheels in your head and you know trying to come up with reasons not to do it. Uh, you should you should build a, build the idea and trying to instead of solving all the problems related to idea that idea in your head you should try to make it out right so because if you wait too long to to build something like that then you would not be able to test uh, those concepts to test those assumptions that you have made right so if we had uh, for example in the in the example that I had showed earlier about our plane. If we had not built that small model, which we built in an, um, maybe in a couple of hours in an afternoon, uh, we would have gone to, gone ahead with that uh, horizontal tail on the top, and we would have faced much more difficulties uh, in trying to come up a ways to solve that. Uh, how can we make it happen instead of actually abandoning abandoning that idea at that point, right? Uh, so, so start prototyping as soon as you can, uh, as soon as you have an idea in your head. Uh, and then you can get it out to others and get others uh, to give feedback on it and talk about it. And uh, from that feedback, test it and improve it and so on. And that cycle will actually help you design your 
final product in a much, much faster, uh, faster way. And uh, finally, uh, this is um, a, a le lesser known aspect of what a prototype can be used for. Uh, and it is uh, to be able to advocate. Um, so uh, what you can do is you can leverage what you have uh, as a prototype and the insights you gain from, from, uh, from doing the testing with that prototype uh, to advocate for changes uh, in the direction or your focus. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, in, if you're in a, especially in a large organization, it can be difficult for you to convince uh, stakeholders to invest money into your idea or in your solution. So what you can do is you, if you build a small prototype, which you haven't spent a lot of money on, and you collect actual numbers on how this is useful for somebody and how that is useful, uh, how it can bring value to anybody, then it is it becomes much, much easier for you to uh, convince those people, convince those stakeholders to actually invest in the idea that you are showcasing to them, right? Uh, so it's oftentimes necessary to demonstrate the value and reasoning behind your uh, your idea and decision. So instead of uh, instead of just talking about, hey, this is my new shiny idea, you can say, hey, this is my new idea, and I have tested it, and 100% of the people like it. Okay, maybe not 100%, but maybe 50% of the people like it, 60% of the people like it, and we can save X amount of money or X amount of time with this, and that actually helps. Uh, can help you with actually furthering your idea. Uh, another aspect which you can do is it's oftentimes if we talk about uh, general public, oftentimes it's difficult for general public to to think about products or services which don't exist yet, right? So they they are more willing to stay with the status quo uh, than to change. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, I have been. Um, I have. I have a colleague who works in. Uh, oh, sorry, ex colleague who works in a startup now, and they are. Um, they are actually trying to disrupt a very traditional market by uh, creating a new marketplace in a construction equipment industry. Uh, and but the thing with those uh, people is, uh, al almost everybody who works in that sector is like. Uh, very traditional. So they don't use uh, computers or internet to buy and sell their equipment. Uh, so if, if, if they had just gone to that, uh, those users and told them, hey, look, we have this interesting idea of making a website where you can um, buy and sell equipment, it's, it's difficult for them to imagine such a thing, like how can we do it, how will it look, and some things like that. But instead, if you had some uh, some quick wireframes or quick designs, which you could show, hey, look, this is how you would see the equipment. This is the this will be the pricing of it. There will be a description. You can see these photos of the of the of the product. Then it's much much easier for them to understand what you're talking about and maybe uh, transition from a very traditional way of working to a to to a modern sense of uh, working. So so prototypes can can be used for this advocation of not just uh, getting more uh, resources for your ideas, but also uh, supporting changes in the direction or focus of uh, user experience. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna pause to see if there are any questions uh, at this point. I don't see any. Are we still alive? Uh, okay. I'll move on, but yeah, just a reminder, if you have any questions, uh, you can always raise your hand or put it in the Q&A section of the, uh, of the uh, webinar. And okay, uh, before we go into uh, the, I promise you there are only a couple of slides left before we actually start talking about the prototyping techniques, uh, but I did want to talk about the fidelity of the prototypes. So. It's a it's an important part of prototyping, and it, it greatly affects what you're testing and how you're testing and what you will get out of that testing, right? So you have to, if you are designing prototypes for uh, any reason, uh, for any new product and service that you are developing, or for even existing products, uh, then choosing a proper fidelity level uh, is 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 a very important part of your uh, process, right? So 
low fidelity, there are three types. So basically there are low fidelity, high mid fidelity and high fidelity prototypes. So low fidelity prototypes are, are really good for testing your core concepts in early stages, right? So if you have an idea, you don't create a high fidelity prototype. At that, at that stage, you probably just want to create a low fidelity uh, prototype and you uh, want to get through your initial ideas and get through their initial uh, fears that you might have uh, and catching any potential problems before they are become too big to fix, right? Uh, again, going back to the early example of, of the plane, that the, the first image that I showed you, which was a small scaled down version, was a, very, was, was a low fidelity prototype, right? So it was it really helped us catch these potential problems with the design very early on before it became too big to, for us to fix, right? So it doesn't really look like your final product uh, product at all, right? It doesn't, uh, it's in a different medium altogether. So maybe if you're developing an app, maybe you have paper prototypes or something like that. So instead of digital, there's a physical um, prototype. Uh, it's, it's different sizes and generally scaled down or scaled up versions, depending on what you're building. Um, and it's not designed with, you know, visual elements kept in mind, right? But of course, you should not completely ignore those, but that's not the main focus of it. Uh, it's also the easiest and cheapest prototype to make because it doesn't require a lot of time and skill to do it. You can just do it quickly with whatever stuff you have available in front of you or around you. Um, because the goal of the low fidelity prototype is to test the biggest and basic assumptions, which is, can I use, is this a good idea? Can I do this? It's a, it's a very broad set of questions that you can use for it. And with this raw, uh, rough, uh, low fidelity prototype, you, you, you can try to uh, get those out very quickly, right? Um, and one of the good things about these low fidelity prototypes is that they look very rough, right? They don't look like a finished product. So if you're if you go and actually talk to your users, um, they won't get bogged down by the user experience of it or the appearance of it, right? They will, be, uh, you can try to focus them more on the actual application of the actual process rather than on the, on the visual interface of the product, right? So just to recap, it's a fast, low scale, cheap, uh, made with materials, whatever is available around you. Um, but on the other hand, it, you know, it limits the, the things that you can test. Uh, and of course, oftentimes it's difficult to test with a larger group of people because oftentimes they are very small, um, maybe mostly in a physical setup. So it's difficult to test with a larger group of people, right? Um, on the other hand, the mid-fidelity uh, prototypes, they start to look like your final product in one dimension and what those dimensions are, I'll talk in the next, next slide, but they are a good balance between cost uh, in terms of time and resources and, and on the other hand, the value of it, right? So they, they start to incorporate visual elements into it, um, some sort of interactions in it, functionalities, um, you know, oftentimes they move to the final medium. So if you are making a digital product, oftentimes the uh, mid fidelity prototype is already in the uh, it's it's already a digital things right so some examples which we'll talk about later on is is like a clickable prototype is is a good example of a mid fidelity prototype right so they are useful for communication and stakeholders who might not be able to work with a low fidelity prototype right so, so oftentimes if you are going to an investor uh, and you want to ask for uh, funding for your uh, startup or something like that then showing them a very rough, very, very rude uh, low fidelity prototype might not be your best option. But also on the other hand, you probably do not want to build a very high class, high fidelity prototype, which looks and works perfectly because it requires time and effort to do that one. So oftentimes mid fidelity is your one of your best choices when it comes to trying to uh, you know communicate with stakeholders uh, like these, you know. So you, you will show a refined view um, of the concept with uh, with better context and everything. And uh, it will take a bit more time than a rough uh, low fidelity prototype for you to make this. But of course, with, uh, with more time comes more interaction, more, more ease to test. Uh, but again, it's not fully functional, right? 
uh, whereas high fidelity prototypes are almost a real deal, right? So they are almost visually what you are trying to build, uh, whether it's in the final medium of uh, like a physical product or maybe with some sort of code in a code behind it. So they have real content. So they will have real data and real uh, real interactions that that the that the users uh, can can interact with, right? So. Uh, some sort of uh, electronic objects, um, like oftentimes if you're working with Arduino or something like that, those become uh, high fidelity prototypes, but they require a lot of time and effort to build, uh, of course. Uh, of course, they also require some sort of skill. You might need some specialized software um, or coding to need to, uh, to build them, right? Uh, if I give you an example, in the earlier slides when I showed you about the plane, the second slide where I showed you a digital, digital mock-up of the plane, that's a very good example of a high fidelity prototype because it had exactly the same elements as a physical, uh, as the physical plane that we built, but just in a digital medium, it was exactly the same with each and every cut and uh, even glue being taken uh, into account uh, in terms of building it, right? So, that's what a high fidelity prototype is. Uh, so it's, it's like almost a complete design with visuals and content and data so that you can actually code those interactions. Uh, and on the other hand, of course, they are more time intensive and require a lot of skills and software and coding. And you probably um, need specialized people to be able to help you with creating those high fidelity prototypes. Uh, so if you go from left to right, the number of ideas that you can test with a low fidelity prototype is high, whereas number of ideas you should be testing with a high fidelity prototype is extremely low, maybe maximum of one or two, uh, if you if you if you if you really want to test your ideas. So high fidelity prototype are more about getting feedback on visual interactions and visuals of the of your uh, of your product. I talked something about dimensions in the previous one. Uh, so depending on what your goal is, um, you will have to choose a um, choose a lower fidelity or a, a prototype or a high fidelity prototype. But even in those, you can sort of affect the dimensions of it, right? So if you look at uh, what are these dimensions, the first one is the visual refinement. So visual refinement is what you would talk, think about as uh, the look and feel of your product, right? So visual refinement is the amount of pixel perfect design or a material polish. So in, in digital environment, you can create, uh, you, uh, for example, in computer aided design, you can actually create a picture perfect object and then assign materials to it so that it actually renders like an actual object would look like, right? So depending on, uh, depending on your goal, again, what you want to test and everything, you can choose a lower fidelity in design, uh, in visual design. Um, and or you can choose a higher fidelity, of course. Uh, using lower fidelity visuals uh, like paper prototypes or wireframes or something like that will focus user feedback on on larger concept of what is the user flow uh, instead of getting reactions on oh I don't like this color or this is too bright or, uh, or the these uh, these uh, this material doesn't feel well uh, or there is too much intricate uh, details in this. Uh, I don't like it. So instead of focusing on those minute elements of your visual design, uh, the focus becomes more on the actual uh, operation and the user flow, right? Uh, the second dimension is the breadth. So the breadth of the prototype indicates how much of the functionality is indicated in the prototype that you build. Uh, you cannot build each and every functionality that you plan to provide. Uh, into your prototype because that also requires time and effort, uh, and each each functionality also needs to be tested accordingly. So, um, if you are smart about it, choosing uh, your breadth uh, breadth fidelity, uh, you will be able to save time and move faster. Uh, so, a lower fidelity of breadth will only focus on like a small function, right? Uh, I'll give an example later on, but we had built a mock-up of a travel app which only did maybe two things which allowed you to check into a public transport and check out of a public transport so that's all it allowed you to do nothing else right 
So that's how that's what we mean by controlling the functionalities that you offer. Of course, you can add more functionalities to it. Like, okay, maybe what if I missed my checkout? What if uh, what if I checked it, checked in uh, at the wrong location? Um, corrections to those and things like that. So those functionalities we could add to those that uh, that prototype and increase the complexity of it and the fidelity of it. But it's not necessary. Uh, for you to do it. So depending on what your goal is, you choose how much functionality to include and how much to not include. Uh, then comes the depth. Uh, so depth of the prototype indicates how much an individual feature, uh, how detailed it is in your prototype, right? So you can have one or multiple deep parts of the prototype depending on uh, the task you create for testing, right? Um, a high fidelity prototype in, in case of a depth will have not just the features, but each and every feature will be detailed out with individual tasks that the users will have to do within your project. So each and every screen will have to be made, each and every interaction will have to be shown. So that's, how, that's what we mean by adding depth to it. Uh, a lower fidelity of the uh, depth is, of course, you just wanna test uh, the, the, whether users like that feature or not. But if you want to know how they want interact with the feature, what do they expect it to happen? What do they expect uh, to not happen? Then you add, need to add depth to that uh, testing element. And uh, the next step is interactivity. So how much of interaction are you adding to the, the, to the app or the product uh, that you are showing to displaying to the user, right? So for examples, maybe you have some buttons, uh, physical buttons, some if you're building some electronics things, then you can have LED reactions uh, to show. Um, so how much of the interaction is there between uh, between the user and the prototype? So how much, uh, how many buttons there are, how, what happens when the buttons are played, pressed, goes into the interactivity part uh, and, and so on. Uh, of course, uh, with low fidelity prototypes, it's harder to test interactions because it's not really meant for that. So if you, want to test uh, interactions you want you have to move a bit higher in the uh, fidelity sense uh, and the final one is data model so data model encompasses the content that the user interacts with uh, in terms of interface uh, and the data utilized in both front end and the back end of the product to give an example if i was testing an app or i was testing a layout for a new website um, i could just put lorem ipsum everywhere in the in the website because my goal is to test the layout and not, not the actual content which is there in the uh, page, right? So that's a very good example of a low dimension on data model. Um, if you want to, of course, if you want to test it on a higher fidelity level, you would actually uh, write down what you want to include in that specific section of the uh, of the website or the page, right? So that's uh, that's what we mean by data model. See how much of the actual data you are using to create this interface between uh, between the user and the product. Yeah. I will pause. Take a moment to see if there are any questions. Also, use that opportunity to drink some water. Uh, one final point here is uh, one prototype can have a different fidelities for each of this dimension in order to specific, uh, fulfill a specific goal, right? So you can have a very high visual refined uh, website layout, but you can have a low data model in terms of what content you have in that, uh, in that website, right? You can have a very beautifully built visual, uh, visual app, but you may not add all the functionalities to it to test. Or maybe you have very good uh, visual app with one functionality which has low breadth, but that functionality is completely uh, designed from, uh, from action and task perspective. So each and every interaction is there. So it's very high depth and high interactivity. So depending on what you're trying to test and how you're testing, you can play around with these different dimensions and create a prototype that you uh, actually want to test, right? Any questions until now before we move to the next part? I, will, I don't see any questions in Q&A. Yeah, I don't see. 
Well, moving to the more interesting aspects is the prototyping techniques. Uh, so different types of ways you can build a prototype, mm -hmm. right? So I'm gonna get this one out of the way, which is wireframes. They're not exactly a prototype because it's often confused with the with the term uh, prototypes, but it's a great way to think about your interactions and communicate in two dimensions, which is sounds very similar to a prototype, but it's not exactly a uh, prototype because you're not testing anything with wireframes. So they are just static layouts of digital products. There's no interaction. There's no. Uh, it's it's more for you to bring your uh, ideas from your head into on, onto a paper, right? So, but it's an important aspect of uh, of prototyping process. Creating wireframe wireframes is a good uh, is a good part of uh, prototyping process because it helps you uh, save time and money again because you can put whatever is in your head onto paper and better understand what your idea is, uh, and and goes um, goes a long way towards uh, to towards uh, building actual prototypes which you can test right. Um, the first uh, method that I want to talk about, and on the left you see actually the uh, the app I was talking about, where we just created quickly some screens about how you can check in and check out of public transport, uh, and it it really took us maybe like ten minutes or fifteen minutes to uh, to create these six screens that you say see in front of you. And what we did was we just took this and we went to uh, to colleagues uh, around us in the building and just talked with them and showed them, hey, here is an app. Uh, how would you work? Uh, you can see there's some, it's not really high on the interactivity element or on the data model, but there are some, uh, it's also not high on visually refined uh, refinement, but there are some key aspects to it, uh, trying to understand if people will use it, how do they use it, what do they understand. And we got about like uh, three or four A4 sized feedback in just like two hours of talking to different people just within our, uh, within our campus. So this is basically the concept behind uh, paper prototyping. It's a oftentimes used um, way of prototyping for especially digital products like apps, games, or uh, or websites and things like that, so it's because it's it just takes what you would see in an app and draws it out in a paper. And what you need is just a piece of paper and maybe some sketch pen. You actually we actually used colorful ones here, but you can just make do with even black uh, black pen or a blue pen. You don't even need different colors, right? So you you don't need the visual refinement. You didn't need to add complexity to it. Um, and it's. It's a very, very quick and efficient way of eliciting early feedback, right? It's also very fun, right? Uh, because, you know, it's just drawing out something quickly. It's also a fun, fun uh, icebreaker sort of a thing that you can do with your team even, you know, just it doesn't require special skills, as you can see. Uh, none of that is like specially designed, uh, somebody with good drawing skills or something. We just, uh, just paper, pen and paper, and we just draw, drew it out. So it's a nice team building activity as well, if you want to look at it. Um, but it just requires um, paper and pen. So it's really low cost, right? Uh, oftentimes it's just available around you. So you don't need to specifically buy anything new or create anything new. So it's really rapid, low cost. And because of that, it's also rapidly iterable, right? So after... 15 minutes of drawing this, if something was not working out, I could just throw it without thinking that, oh my God, I've spent weeks designing, trying to design this. And I could just start new and create something new in like another 15 minutes. So it's really rapidly iterative, right? Um, and because it's not so good looking in that sense, you can get a lot of honest feedback uh, because oftentimes what happens is if you go to a, a customer with a finished product, they see how much time and effort you have actually put into uh, put into building this uh, prototype or uh, or your actual product, and they might be a bit uh, skeptical of giving you uh, honest uh, critical feedback. Uh, so, um, paper prototypes because they look sketchy, they look uh, rough. Uh, it makes people somehow more comfortable to criticize any aspect of it, right? Uh, then something which is polished design, which looks like you have spent a lot of time into. Uh, it seems a bit counterintuitive, but it's it's what it is. Um, of course, there are some drawbacks to it. Um, it's hard to collect feedback because if you wanna 
um, collect feedback, you're limited to this one set which we have created and you have to physically with the person showcase, show them the product and then keep, keep collect feedback and you can't really automate that collection of feedback process, right? So, so the testing is only in one person. So it's not geographically dispersed. So you might have a lot of biases in the in the feedback that you collect. So you, it's a, it's a bit limited in its uh, in its feedback capabilities. But the good thing about it is very rapid and very uh, low cost, right? You can add complexities to to this. Is uh, another example that I want to showcase to you is is this one is where you can see that. Uh, it's very high, uh, it's low on the visual design element because it's not the best thing uh, ever uh, in terms of looks, but it does have a lot of uh, interactivity and it has a lot of uh, data models into it and depth and um, uh, depth and uh, breadth to the, the, the functionalities which is being offered. So you can see that, uh, you know, on the on this, uh, what, what, what we would do is we, uh, you can uh, move the, uh, depending on what the user selects, you can move the uh, mobile screen across and you go to the next screen, right? Uh, and then if they pre pre uh, press on plus, then you can, uh, using those uh, paper strips at the bottom, you can move it. So it actually uh, simulates what will happen uh, when, the, uh, when the user interacts with the, with, the, uh, with the app or with the product, right? So it, it, it has a lot of interactivity and it has a lot of complexity, but again, the limitations of, uh, you know, somebody has to be there so that those uh, interactions could be recorded. And uh, if, if they pl press on plus, then that four can be pl placed on the top of three, or if they pl press minus, then the two can be, so somebody needs to be there always to facilitate this entire conversation and uh, interaction, right? Uh, this one is a bit early on, but I can show it to you and then we can talk about physical prototypes later on. But papers are not just useful for digital prototypes. Papers are also useful for physical prototypes, right? For physical products, you can also build paper prototypes, right? Uh, we'll come to uh, physical prototypes a bit later, but I just wanted to show that you can use paper to just build anything basically, uh, and you can create everything out of it. Um, the next step is often uh, a digital or a clickable prototype. So we're still with a digital product, so that's why uh, uh, this is the next step. But from uh, from paper prototypes, you can easily move to click clickable prototypes. There are some really good softwares out there which can help you with that. I'll showcase some of them in the next slides. But with this, what you can do is actually automate the interactions a bit and make it easier to test for yourself, right? Because uh, if you in automate the interaction when when the user interacts, then you don't have to do anything. The the algorithms and the the, and the code actually makes it possible to have that those uh, interactions to be automated. So it's still a low fidelity, uh, maybe a bit on the mid size. Uh, so you can convert uh, paper prototypes into uh, clickable prototypes. Uh, it makes it easier uh, to. It, uh, it gives some sort of uh, a bit of professional appearance, depending on how far you go with creating the screens. You can actually get very close to the final uh, final um, look and feel, right? So if you have properly designed uh, screens that you see, uh, for example, on the left, um, then you can actually it gives a, a better appeal of what you're uh, showing, right? Uh, and of course, because you have those interactions coded into it. Um, you can test those realistic interactions with this one, right? Uh, because they are digital, you can also send it to anybody anywhere and therefore you can test with a wider range of people, uh, geographically dispersed people and get a bit more diverse feedback and reduce your bias, right? Um, they also um, are quite iterable, uh, not as much as paper, not because it needs a bit more effort than a paper prototype. But uh, you can you can quickly iterate on these as well, right? So you can quickly change things into the uh, into this ones as well. Um, and the good thing about this is because you don't have to focus on uh, because the interaction is uh, automated, you don't have to focus on uh, on simulating those interaction for the users. You can focus on facilitating the test and observing the uh, how the user interacts with your uh, with your product. Of course, there is there are some uh, disadvantages. 
for example, the learning curve for these tools can be a bit uh, steeper, you know, not, not as much, but a bit steeper uh, compared to a paper and a pen. Uh, you still need to be a bit more digitally savvy to be able to use these products, right? Uh, uh, it's a bit slower than paper prototypes, but not as much. Uh, and of course, if you want to make changes, then it also takes a bit more time, right? So iteration is slower. Uh, speed of creation is also slower, but you can test more realistic interactions and you can test them with uh, users everywhere, right? Uh, I wanted to give this one as an example uh, because this is an interesting app uh, which Marvel developed, uh, the comics. Uh, they had this interesting uh, problem uh, in the past where they, where the designers would create uh, uh, would create some sort of a comic or something and they had no way they used to just uh, they wanted to develop some sort of interactive comics uh, so you know when people would click on something then uh, it's a digital comic and if people would choose some aspect then the story would change accordingly uh, so they what they did was they created this uh, uh, this tool where actually you can take images of your paper prototype and then automate things into it, right? So if we, for example, if we look at this one, so I could take photo of each and every screen that you see uh, here, and I can create zones. So for example, the checkout button on the top uh, top right, I can create a zone around it saying, if I click on, if somebody clicks on that, then this happens, right? So I can, it does, it's not really actual lot of coding involved, but you can simulate these interactions. So you can just take photos of your paper prototype if you have already created them and convert it into a digital prototype in just a matter of minutes, right? So it's a really interesting and useful app. It's also a fun app if you just want to try something, uh, try it out, but you can, uh, it's, it's, it's really fun. So there are, um, so this is a very good way of doing it. So it's called Marvel Pop, um, but there are other apps as well, right? So, one of the most un overlooked uh, tool when it comes to creating prototypes is Keynote and PowerPoint, right? Um, like you can use, you can create interactions even within PowerPoint slideshows where when you click something happens, when you click this, something else happens, right? You can create hyperlinks and you can create all of that things. Uh, also, if you remember in the uh, in my story about our living room design, I used PowerPoint to draw draw everything out. So it's a very versatile tool, um, for example, Keynote and PowerPoint, or for that matter, to some extent, Google Slides as well, which you can use to actually uh, create some digital prototypes as well. Uh, and then there is the Marvel Pop that we talked about. Uh, then we uh, then there is Axure, Balsamic, there's a list of uh, products that you can use. Um, and um, they go from low fidelity to high fidelity, right? So I try to sort them out as much as I could, but now as the as these products go, they also you can also use some of them to create high fidelity prototypes uh, in themselves. Uh, the last one is interesting. So it's Illustrator or Sketch. So you use Illustrator. So you're still not actually coding anything, but what you do is you use Photoshop or Illustrator or Sketch to actually design the screens professionally uh, to uh, design them as they would look in an Android or an iOS app or a Windows app. So you can actually design them in, in those softwares and then import them into one of those tools, uh, which you see above this Axure, Balsamic or InVision, for example, you can import those sketches in that and then in create interactions within them. So it's a very high fidelity because it's almost as, much, as good as uh, it will look in your actual product but still you have not done any actual coding uh, related to the app, right? Uh, so that's why it's high fidelity at the, at the bottom. Uh, on the left, you see an, an, another example that uh, we had developed, uh, which was an app for, uh, which was almost now five years ago, almost, uh, which was, uh, we were thinking about an app for uh, sharing uh, office spaces, uh, so not not like a co-working space, but like a off if you have own a building and if you have some office space, then you could put it on quarter share, which is, is sort of like a Airbnb for for workspaces, right? So uh, it, what you see is actually 
none of that is being actually coded. It's just power, uh, you know, you, we use PowerPoint to actually just create screens. And then we downloaded some mobile cut layouts and we just put those screens inside that. So it looks like it's an actual app, but it's in reality, none of that is actually exist at this point. So you can actually use multi a combination of these tools to create uh, good looking prototypes that you might want to use uh, for your testing. Uh, any questions about these two types? Okay, well, if we move to the next one, uh, this is a bit uh, different than the ones we have talked about because it's it doesn't even actually create any product at all, right? Uh, which is interesting on how uh, how it is because in explainer videos, uh, which I am sure all of us have seen explainer videos at some point or the other, but it's a very short video which focuses on explaining your idea in a simple, engaging way in a visual format, right? Mm -hmm. So you try to use a clear, concise language uh, and appealing, attractive visuals with some snappy music and try to showcase what your idea is right so it's it's a both informational and educational uh it explains what what, what the, it is and uh, what the product is and why it is the best option in the market and things like that uh so it has it has an interesting potential to be used as prototype right so you can create a prototype like uh, can create an explainer video of your product instead of actually building even a prototype and you can uh showcase it to people show hey look this is a this is what it will do uh, and this is how uh, you can uh, use it uh, and you can al already start getting feedback uh, unfortunately i couldn't find the video note uh, anymore but in early days of dropbox uh, even building a simple pro uh, working prototype would have been very expensive right trying to build this cloud interaction would have cost a lot of money um, so instead, what they did was uh, to better explain the concept of cloud storage and everything to, uh, to normal people. What they did was they created this simple uh, video where, you know, a thing, uh, where they would show file icons moving from one uh, system to another and how you could then uh, remove uh, the file from other device. So it was just explaining what the Dropbox would do uh, to a normal person in a very simple way. Uh, using this uh, these visuals right uh, so instead of building anything they've just put that on their website and said hey if you're interested uh, in such a product leave us your email right so that way they knew they tried to find out how many people came to their website how many watched the video how many left their email so that way they could determine what their market size was how much interest was there in such a product right uh, and that's a very uh, good way of doing it so there are certain characteristics of a explainer video, like it's generally very short. So you try to keep it at a half a minute or a one and a half minutes, maybe. So you don't want to create like a five minute uh, or two hour long video. It should be short, simple, you know, oftentimes you use as animated characters instead of actual people, but there's nothing wrong with using actual people in it as well. Uh, you use nice visuals, you use bright, warm colors, you put an energetic uh, snappy music to it and if you you try to have some sort of a professional voiceover or something like that uh, if you can afford that uh, onto the video it's not super required uh, i am going to try to sh show a video i made uh, so in my previous job i want uh, I, I wanted to give these trainings to our employees so i wanted to um, understand if people would be interested in these trainings. So what I did was I created this video. I shared it to all these people uh, and see how many people uh, replied back and said, hey, I'm interested in such a video, uh, such a training, right? So let me show you this video. Let's hope it works and you can hear the sound. If somebody can confirm they can hear the sound, that would be good.
Get the point. Uh, I forgot that we just said angry note in my case. Uh, so, as uh, you say, some sound is good. Okay. Uh, yes, we do hear the voice. Yeah. Thanks uh, for co confirming. Um, well, but you get the idea. So, uh, the last part of the video lies saying, oh, we have these participants who have said uh, something, something nice. Uh, uh, I see a question from Robert. Are videos costly? We are considering this, but the resources we found available for this seemed expensive. How much did a video like the one you showed cost? Actually, it costs nothing for me. Uh, so there is a website called, uh, I'll type it in the chat if uh, um, uh, it's useful. Uh, I used it. It's called Biteable. Uh, I hope you got the answer, but I did not. I'll chat, try it in the uh, type it in the chat as well. Uh, okay, everyone. It's called Biteable. Uh, they had um, a month uh, like it's a subscription service where you can. They have these uh, stock animations that you can use, um, and what you can. So I just took the stock animations. Uh, Actually, it was more uh, of a process. Okay, I, I decided what I wanted to say. Uh, I write, uh, wrote down small statements around it. And then I looked into what kind of animations they had and I tried to use those to actually tell the story that I wanted to tell. Uh, so it's a subscription service. I think it's like, it was when I had subscribed to it, like about 340 euros a year or something like that. With, uh, but they had a bit limited animations available. Uh, I know that since then they have grown a bit. Uh, I've not used them for a while now. The last time I used it, I actually uh, applied for the EGI job and I created a video uh, about myself. I can show it to you later, uh, that one as well. Um, but uh, because the first month was free, uh, actually I just created this video and I, I showed it to everybody. And they liked it so much. And then we actually actually bought a subscription for a couple of years and we made uh, many more videos uh, using that. So I, I do recommend uh, checking something like Biteable uh, for, for your uh, purposes. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Robert. Uh, there might be other services. I can look uh, look up and uh, send, it to, uh, send it to this group later on, if that helps. Um, there's another video that I want to show to you. This is actually by IDEO, uh, one of the most famous design companies, uh, the, the company which has basically pioneered design thinking, right? So they were actually working with a, with a mobile app designer, uh, and they wanted to create, a, uh, to showcase an app, uh, uh, which was like, the, like a game for children around Muppets, right? Or monsters, rather. So they created this interesting video to showcase the capabilities of the app, right? So instead of actually coding anything, uh, you have to use your imagination that the guy that you see in the video is actually a um, is actually a monster. But uh, you'll get the point. You get the point of it. Uh, let's see. Cue music. So this is um, possible dance moves for monster making. So music starts. And I'm the player, so I come in and I touch the monster, and he gives me a special dance move. <laughs> I go and touch again, and he does a different one. And I can go for as long as I want, and he has a few signature moves. And when I've had enough and I'm done dancing, I push the back button, and it pauses, and the music stops. Monster maker. <laughs> cool. Sonic. <laughs> Sonic. <laughs> Whoa. <Get in> there. <laughs> yeah. 
so as you can see, they actually didn't build any app. They didn't build any claim. Um, but to actually showcase the uh, functionalities, uh, you can see how this can be very useful, right? You just have this cut out. You just show this video, except for the last part. The last part is more fun. But if you want to showcase it to maybe investors or you want to showcase it to, uh, to people to tell what this app could actually do, this is a really good video for it, right? Uh, I see there is a question or Yeah. Uh, I will let you know if there are any other uh, resources like that. Yeah, thanks. A uh, lot of the softwares that I mentioned earlier also have like a free tier or a subscription tier. So uh, those are useful as well uh, if you want to build something like this. So um, it's not just for digital products that you can create uh, prototypes. You can create it for physical products as well. Uh, oftentimes, you mainly use it for testing functionality or test the aesthetics. So like the feel of it, uh, if, the, if it, it's too big for your hand or something like that, if you want to. So on the left, you actually see, uh, if I'm not wrong, it's, it's one of those Canon um, uh, flim, um, I think it's called Mini X or Mini 9X or something like that. It's a it's an old school flim uh, flim based camera. Uh, so they they created these uh, wooden prototypes out of those. That's just a very common uh, practice uh, to create wooden prototypes or uh, uh, plastic or uh, or wax prototypes for uh, objects like this. Uh, so you're often testing uh, the looks of the products, the dimensions, the ergonomics, the feel of it, and the visual design, right? So uh, it's a good way of doing that. Uh, you can also test it for mechanisms or like if, if things work, you know, if you can reach the button uh, on the camera or not, uh, and you can test the dur durability and reliability. Uh, you can, of course, make, uh, when you're in the last stages of the design, you can make the same camera out of different materials to understand how a certain material feel or uh, how the durability of that material is compared to the durability of the other material. Uh, I want to show you some other examples. It's not mine, uh, those examples, but uh, I like this one because this is the same bag uh, that I have, uh, but not exactly, but uh, the early prototype of my, uh, of the backpack that I have, it's uh, from a company called XT Design. Um, they create, they made these uh, paper prototypes in their early design stages to understand how the big, how bag, how the bag is and how it feels and how it looks on the back of the people. Uh, so you can create physical prototypes using paper as well. Uh, one of the other examples was what I showed, showcased earlier with, with all the furnitures and everything uh, made out of paper, right? But you're not restricted to just paper when it comes to uh, physical prototypes, right? You can use clay, you can use foam, you can use anything else that you want, right? Uh, this is an example of a uh, of a clay model uh, being made out of made for a for a helmet, uh, which can be um, it's it's a two scale model, so you can actually see it before actually you craft it out or something like that. Uh, there are other ways. Uh, this was one of the first uh, images that I showed to you uh, for making physical prototypes is uh, actually converting them into digital prototypes. So there are dedicated softwares that uh, which I'll sh uh, showcase some of them in the next steps, uh, next slide, sorry, uh, which will allow you to build your products in a 3D environment, right? Uh, so instead of actually building something uh, physically, you build it digitally. Uh, it also helps, uh, it also significantly speeds up the design process or the, the build process, right? Because if some of the elements are repetitive, you can just, you know, clone them, you know, control C, control V. Uh, like, for example, in this specific example, each of the cross section of the wing that you see is like a, in an in a airfoil air shape. So if you, if we had to make it, we had to cut each one out separately uh, when we are making a physical model. So instead on the digital environment, it's much easier to manipulate that and, and to create uh, two scale models to see if things can fit together, where, where are the structural. Uh, the good things about these uh, softwares is now you can assign materials to them. You can assign their uh, different characteristics of the materials to them and test what areas would fail uh, under what loads and things like that. So it's really useful uh, from that perspective. So you don't have to actually build a product and then apply uh, forces to it to understand how and when it will break. You can just try to simulate that in a, in a digital environment, right? 
uh, of course, uh, there are some uh, pros and cons related to creating such uh, digital prototypes of physical products. Um, you know, the good things are you can visualize your product, you can actually render uh, actually how they will look by assigning materials to it and everything. Uh, you can design in real dimensions so you can see how things fit with each other. One biggest problem with uh, physical prototypes is if you create something small uh, as a prototype, it's good, it's, it's nice and everything. But as you grow something bigger, the, the complexity and the, the difficulties with joints and, uh, and connections uh, increases twice, right? So everything, when it becomes big, uh, something which, which is stable when it's small will not be stable when it's big and uh, too big, right? Uh, so everything, you can test all of this in the digital environment without actually building. So you can work with real dimensions instead of scaled down models. Uh, you can also use it to check accessibility of certain components. So if you build something and then, okay, you figure out, oh, I cannot access the button, then you have to start again uh, and work again towards it. But with a digital version, you can just then redo the design uh, as, as soon as possible. It's also infinitely more iterable than an actual physical prototype, right? So it takes, uh, it doesn't take as much and as much uh, resources to build, uh, to iterate on it. Uh, on a digital prototype. Uh, of course, there are cons. You need dedicated softwares uh, to do it. Uh, you need people who can actually work with those softwares. There are people who, um, so I used to work for uh, automotive companies uh, before I worked, uh, before I moved to Netherlands. And there are people who it's their day job uh, who on work on these softwares like the day in, day out to de uh, design components on it. So oftentimes it can be very, very uh, difficult to get hands on your on this. Now there are some web-based uh, tools which, are, uh, which you can use to actually speed on up the process, but, um, but you still need to understand how, what, what different terms mean and how can you fast make something faster in a, in a digital environment. Uh, often expensive because you need uh, either need people, you need to hire people who can do it or uh, and or you need softwares and licensing of those softwares can be quite expensive as well. Uh, so even though it's cheaper in a longer run, the initial investment point can be quite higher with, with these products. Uh, these are some uh, some tools that you can uh, think of uh, when when if you are if you do want to create such prototypes. Um, Again, uh, just to iterate that it takes a lot of time to learn these softwares, to learn how they work. It's almost like if you were working with a full blown Photoshop, right? Uh, some of them have simplified quite a bit like SketchUp and uh, if I'm not wrong, Tinkercad are, are quite simpler on the simpler sides, but then they don't have enough functionalities often as well. Uh, and on the other hand, something like Katia or Proe uh, uh, have lot of functionalities, but then with the functionalities comes the complexities uh, and their licensings are quite expensive as well often. Uh, by the way, some of them are, uh, are online, uh, so you can use them in your browsers, uh, but often like if I'm, but I think Katia also has a cloud version which you can use online now, but Katia and Proe used to be like full-blown Windows software which you had to install on your system and you needed good uh, good capabilities on your system as well. So there is some cost associated with that as well. Well, uh, it would not be a session uh, which, where I, if I don't talk about Legos, uh, because Legos are really, 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 really versatile, right? Uh, you can take the versatility of uh, the Legos and the ease of access uh, that you can get with them and you can create quick and simple prototypes of your ideas as well. Um, you can go as complex as you want and you can keep it as simple as you want. If you just wanna see if something works or how something could look, you can just work with the design uh, part or you can actually in incorporate uh, the electronics uh, like the motors and stuff like that to actually build a working prototype which works as well. So. Uh, you know, you can take advantage of that as a, as a designer, as a as a product developer, to uh, use Legos to build something uh, something like this. Um, 
I always show this example uh, because with Legos, only your imagination is your limit. Uh, so whatever you can think of, you can actually, and probably has been built by somebody uh, using, using Legos. So this is a full scale Bugatti variant where everything except the, the, the grill and the, the wheels are made out of Legos. Uh, and it actually works. So there's an actual working engine. So it, it's not very, of course, it doesn't go as fast as uh, an actual Bugatti Veyron, but it goes, I think, about 12 or 13 kilometers per hour. So it's an actual working prototype uh, built just out of Legos. Um, but you can use uh, some other, uh, you know, you can, you don't have to go into this much detail at, uh, at this point. It can be a good hobby, but you can use the, the, versatility to your advantage. Uh, one of the fi uh, final ones I wanna talk about are electronic prototypes. Uh, on the left, you see Arduinos, which is quite common these days, which people use to actually build uh, these kind of electronic uh, kits. So um, it's often useful for uh, electronic products like you know, uh, used for uh, wristwatches or things like that is, is using uh, using these kits to simulate uh, simulate what kind of uh, functionalities these things offer, right? So they they often come with microcontrollers, and then you can separately buy what kind of sensors you want or what kind of motors you want. Um, and one example is Arduino, but there are other options which you can use, like Little Bits or Adafruit or SparkFun and things like that to actually build your kits. Uh, I'm not very familiar with this one because uh, I have not worked with them. So I don't have a lot of examples. And I think uh, this is the wrong slide. Um, but this one was one of my colleagues who built it. Um, it's, it's what you see is what is uh, on the, on the, uh, in the gray box is where he has all the circuits with Arduino board inside it. And the black one you see is, is, a, is just a sensor with a sensor uh, read, uh, in front of it. And the uh, and the iPad is just uh, the 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 pad is just uh, be, uh, is a visualizing element. Uh, what his idea was, he wanted to. Uh, this was in 2017 again, so long time ago. Uh, his idea was he wanted to automate the inventory uh, making uh, making inventory in the warehouses that my previous company had. Uh, so he wanted to put RFIDs on each uh, on each of the boxes that they had. And then use that. I uh, use this as a way of just like swinging it around to just calculate how many RF uh, IDs it captures and how so how many how much stock and inventory we have. He was a bit ahead of his time. Now a lot of uh, shops use RF IDs to uh, to fast uh, to fast checkouts. Um, but yeah, you can see that you can use electronics to actually build something. Of course, you need to code the uh, code the entire thing, and you you need to uh, to do all of that. So it's it's not a low fidelity prototype that you can just whip up and uh, use. It requires quite a bit of significant effort in terms of building it uh, and gathering materials and how you're gonna implement it and writing the code and stuff like that. From a complicated one, we go to a very very simple one. Uh, to so, so simple that it is fake. Uh, I am hoping everybody's heard of Wizard of Oz. Uh, um, it's the story in which uh, you have this magical, um, deceptive being behind a curtain who creates um, who creates these uh, magic uh, during the story, right? But in reality, he's just a man with who just uses uh, special things to to give the appearance of the magic, and that's basically the. Uh, the concept behind Wizard of Oz uh, prototype. So you fake the functionalities. It's used, It's based on the principle of fake it till you make it, right? So you just mimic some aspect of your product for the sake of prototyping, um, right? So you you know just like that small man behind the curtain fake the power of the wizard. You fake the features that you want to test, right? Um, this one requires a quite a bit of time and effort uh, more in terms of creativity to think on how you can fake it so it, it actually goes in the other direction so instead of thinking about how you can make it you have to start thinking about how you can fake it right 
uh, a good example of a of a wizard of Oz prototype is is this is from very very early days uh, of uh, of uh, digital assistants, right? So there was a company called Ardwar. Uh, which wanted to connect people with questions, uh, uh, right? So they wanted to create this network and algorithm where somebody asked a question uh, through voice, and then somebody would the 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 algorithm would uh, translate that in and find the answer and give it back to them, right? So instead of actually coding this mechanism where the system understands what the question is, searches for the answer, and then provides the best answer to the person. What they did was they wanted to see if these, somebody would actually use something like this. You know, is it even useful in the first place to build such a system? So what they created was they had this fake person, right? Uh, which is true for almost all digital assistants that you see is you were tricked into thinking that there was, an, uh, there was somebody who was, uh, in case of Ardwar, uh, you were tricked into thinking that there was a computer giving you the answer. But in reality, there was a team of people who would look at what you have asked, find the answer and type it out and send it back to you, right? So it was actually much easier to test it this way than actually code the, uh, to code the aspects of it. So a lot of the digital assistants in the early days, uh, the, the users like we were tricked uh, into thinking that the system responses are computer-based uh, when they were actually just human uh, responses, right? Um, and based on these interactions on how we interacted, how, how the questions were asked, this was then used to actually build those digital assistants. And now, now that when you talk, uh, you think that it's a human, but in reality, uh, we are in the opposite side and it's all generally always a computer responding to you. We use something similar in my previous company as a, as a, uh, as a technique to test one of our ideas. So we had this idea that, okay, we can, we wanted to test a 4D experience, right? A 4D viewing experience. So I used to work for a cable comp company. So we were thinking about what is the next uh, next entertainment uh, uh, medium for, uh, for, for users. So one of the ideas we had was, okay, how about we create this 4D experience for people within, the, within, within their homes, right? So using smart home and using uh, other mechanisms, how can we, bring all the other elements of their house into in, uh, house into uh, into the viewing experience and that way then we can use it to uh, we use it to create this 4d experience within their house right so it's a very unique value propositions that we were trying to offer to our customers so of course that comes with the problem that um, okay how do you actually building such a system would take a lot of time in reality so how do you actually test it, right? So what we did was we invited a couple of our users, which you see on sitting on the on the right hand corner, uh, who who's, uh, who came to our uh, who came to our office, and this was just a testing room that we had, uh, and they were um, yeah they, we we invited them. We just told them, oh, we wanted we want you to come experience this 4D experience that we are trying to build, and maybe give us some feedback if you have anything related to it. So we invited them to the office. They sat down. The, the, you see, um, one of my colleagues explaining it to him. Hey, uh, this is the case. How how do you? Uh, this is what we're gonna do. You're gonna watch. You can watch what uh, in this movie. We we're gonna play this movie, and then you can watch this movie. Uh, because of course we wanted to fake it, so we wanted to control what they were gonna to watch, so we could actually offer the 4D experience, right? So after his explanation and everything, they would start watching the TV. And at certain intervals, the lighting would change. The, the 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 sofa that they were sitting on would actually move, uh, you know, shake a bit, uh, and that would create this 4D experience, uh, which in reality was controlled by this guy that you see in uh, in this uh, behind this black curtain. He was actually controlling the the lights of the room and uh, controlling everything. So it's literally the wizard of the Oz behind a black curtain. And then we had one more colleague sitting behind these, uh, uh, behind this projector who would then shake the, uh, shake the sofa to create this 4D experience. It sounds a bit silly, but it, with that we realized uh, whether or not people prefer such an experience 
uh, in, in their in their home environment, and that was very important for us to understand how our smart home uh, connections would work with our uh, with our devices and whether uh, whether we we need to think about those interactions with uh, with the cable TV or not. And this uh, this was a very unique project, and um, yeah, this was a really good example of a Wizard of Oz uh, kind of technique. Uh, the final one that I want to talk about uh, is storyboarding, right? I talked about it a bit earlier, but telling stories is an excellent, excellent way of guiding people through a user experience. Whether it's a new experience or whether it's an old new user experience, storyboarding is actually a <coughs> excellent way. So it, uh, I, know, I think everybody knows where storyboarding comes from. It comes from the film industry, right, where they map out each and every scene to decide where they're going to keep the cameras, where they're going to place the cameras so they can capture the optimal shots, which then can be used in, uh, which then can be edited out to make an actual uh, movie, right? So they create these storyboards with each and every scene, but what happens in that scene written down and just quick sketches about it, right? Um, and it's a really unique prototyping method because it ensures that you know your users well enough, right? Because if you do not know your users and what they are doing and how they are doing it, you can, cannot actually create a storyboard of their experience because what happens next, you won't be able to answer, right? So if you're creating a storyboard where first panel is this and the second panel is that, you won't know what comes after. So it really forces you to put yourself in the shoes of your uh, user or the customer and actually come up with ways and method, what, what do they do? Why do they do their motivations? It really creates this empathetic uh, understanding of user in your head, right? Um, it's so storyboarding is not just useful as a prototyping method, but it's also useful in early design processes or early ideation processes, right? So if you wanna better understand the problem so you can solve the problem, you wanna do storyboarding, you can also do storyboarding. So you can draw out what is how the person reaches the problem, right? So maybe he gets up in the morning, he uh, he brushes his teeth, he puts the TV on, or something like that. And you can draw out each of that to understand how the person reaches uh, the situation that he actually reaches, right? Um, so it's often a, also a good way of bypassing any sort of jargon or um, technological babble that you have. You know, and just create a simple story and a, a simple uh, problem and solution resolution, right? So it's a it's a very important tool. And uh, oh, sorry, that didn't go as well as I thought. Uh, um, it's a very important tool in human centered design. It's something again which IDEO has been talking about for a while now, where you put the put the people in the center of your design. So it's not about the feasibility, it's not about the viability, it's about the desirability of your customers, right? So they are an engaging way uh, and an entertaining way uh, which can be used to address uh, these, uh, these human-centered uh, design problems. Uh, you can uh, you have the flexibility of showing how the story goes, right? So how do you use a storyboard is you can show with one storyboard, you can show what the current life is, what the current situation is, how the person reaches the problem, how they currently solve it, and how is it not good, right? And then you can create a second storyboard where you just change the final panels, right? Uh, you can change it to your solution and how your solution fits into this entire world around the user. So you can create this entire uh, engrossing uh, experience for the user using storyboards, yeah. Well, uh, I'm not gonna go too much into testing your prototypes because it's a whole webinar in itself on different kind of validation techniques that can be used for uh, validating prototypes and gathering information from your uh, users. Uh, but if you do create prototypes, if you do want to create prototypes for any sort of work, uh, it is important that you create a plan. Planning, 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 planning is an important step of uh, of entire design process. So you create a research plan. You need to understand 
what you are going to test. You have to plan what you are going to test, right? So what you are going to test, uh, maybe you want to test the feasibility of a certain feature. Maybe you just want to test the in interaction of a user with a certain uh, certain feature that you are developing. So you have to plan what you're going to test because that will determine what you're going to build as your prototype and how you're going to build it, right? Then you need to plan how you're going to test it, right? So are you going to give it to them, then ask questions? Are you going to interact with them during this process? Uh, how are you going to test this prototype? Is it going to be a digital prototype? Is it going to be a physical prototype? And how, who will you test it on? Who are your users? Where are, where are they, right? Uh, where are they? So you have to plan that aspect. Where can you find them? If you want to test somebody and uh, they're not, uh, they not in your city, then you need to plan that as well. Okay, how are you going to get access? So where are your users actually located? Where, are the, uh, where, are the, where is the place where you should uh, actually go so that you can find the users where you can test your actual uh, prototype? plan what you will ask them, right? So you shouldn't just, it's not that you should have a specific set of questions and stick to them, but have a better understanding of what you can ask them. But it could be that when you're actually doing the uh, interview or whatever kind of validation technique you're using, you realize that there are other important questions to be asked because maybe they used it in a completely different way than you had imagined. So then maybe it's easier and better for you to ask them question okay why did you use it in this way uh, what how did it help you know instead of asking oh how did you find it you know because that's not important at that point because they have not used it for the uh, for the thing that you have designed it for right uh, another important thing about what you will ask them is in no circumstances tell them what is the exact thing you are testing on right we wanted to know if this is a good idea it's not a good question uh, or it's not a good starter because most people will say, oh, I think it's a good idea, right? So it's a very tactful skill of interviewing and asking questions to get the answers, but not getting the answers you want to hear because that is an important part of the design process is you do not ask these leading questions which lead to answers that you want to hear because then you end up in a situation where you have designed something which nobody in reality wants, but you never realize that because they just gave you the answers that you wanted to hear. So it's a very in, uh, important skill to learn to how to ask these questions that uh, which give you answers that you want to get, but not the ones you want to hear, right? So it's not just supporting the assumptions you have, oh, I think this is a good idea and finding customers who will support that assumptions, uh, but it is also about rejecting those assumptions that you have about your own idea. We often fall in love with, your, with our own ideas because it's our ideas uh, and prototyping uh, and validation should be a way to get rid of those ideas uh, because you should not do an idea just because it's a, you think it's a good idea. You should do an idea because it's actually needed by people. It actually solves a problem or meets a need of the, of the user. Uh, and that's it from me. Uh, thank you for your attention uh, and uh, attending this uh, webinar. Uh, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to take them now. I see there's something in the chat, but okay. Okay, uh, Robert. Yes, Robert. I'll let you know if there are any other resources that can be interesting uh, from a video making point of view. Any other questions? I cannot see anybody, so it's uh, it's difficult for me to gauge if people are still alive, uh, if they are still or they have fallen asleep. Hi, Elisa. Yes, you can speak. Hi, um, I have a question. You presented several techniques for, for prototyping, but yeah. when a company is already working whatever service and they have to improve or to test any type of a new feature or solution, which of the uh, technique do you, would you recommend? Uh, depends what you want to test, right? So if uh, if it's just uh, at that point, you want to know whether it, uh, whether certain feature or good is, uh, is good or not, maybe you can just go for, a, uh, you know, if you have easy access to your users, then maybe you can just go and build a paper prototype and showcase that to them, right? 
uh, hey, look, this is uh, me thinking about this, and here is the pro uh, here is the prototype, and see how they interact with it. Um, if they are not easily accessible, then I would say go for a clickable prototype. Um, the other option is if it's easier and if you have resources, then you can actually do something what is called as an A-B testing, right? Uh, where within your if where within if it is possible in your uh, service is to create two instances where half of your users goes to one instance and half of the users go to other instance, which has more, which has the other functionality that you are talking about uh, and see how they, how these, uh, how these users behave and how the other users behave. So it's, it, it depends on wh what you want to test. And that's why I didn't get into details about which is the best technique or which is not the best technique, because it really depends on what you're testing and what, what, sort of design process you are in already. Oh, thank you, Anne. Can I ask another question? <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, well, um, I'm thinking in this type of group of people participating in multiple tests, that they are like volunteers uh, for different type of uh, testing and so. Would you recommend to go for this type of already predefined groups of testing? Or you encourage better to directly go to your potential customers? Uh, always go to your customers uh, because that's who will use it eventually, right? Um, there's no point in testing a, a app uh, for old people uh, with somebody who's 15 years old, for example. Right, because they are not the same person. They are not the same. They don't have the same requirements. They don't have the same needs. So uh, it's always as much as possible go to your users for actual testing. Uh, if you cannot, of course, you can try uh, to go uh, go to a go to somebody else. But uh, remember that that feedback is not as useful as you as you think because it's not tested with an actual user. Uh, so it's 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 not completely removed your assumptions that is that oh this is a good idea, but you don't really know that because you've not tested with the actual person who is going to buy or use your product. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, Sergio, for the context. Yeah. Um, the, the the new EJI website they used uh, uh, a sketch for creating the UI mockup said and that for two months you used the Miro and sketch to design the whole website before they even wrote a line of code and that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much the the uh, the idea behind it right that you don't code anything without actually uh, agreeing that this is what you want to uh, build right and that's the principle behind uh, behind prototyping. Any other questions, uh, comments? Okay, uh, Gwen, maybe we can stop recording. <laughs>